In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. God, our Father, we thank you and we praise you and we bless you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and the wonderful gift of salvation that was won for us through the cross, the gift of new life that was given to us through his resurrection. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit and dwelling within our soul through the sacrament of baptism, for the special outpouring of the Holy Spirit and the sacrament of confirmation. We thank you, Father, for the gift of our Catholic faith, especially in this year of faith, as we meditate upon the divine mysteries revealed to us, in particular tonight, the second coming and the end times. We thank you, Father, for your plan of salvation. We thank you for the definitive victory that your Son has won for us at the end of time, in the second coming. And as we wait in joyful hope for that coming, may we have the grace to persevere in this journey of faith. May we persevere into the end, to die in friendship with Christ, so that we may enter into the glory of the beatific vision. Father, we thank you for this night of catechesis and reflection to dive into the divine mysteries revealed to us in your holy word as taught by Holy Mother Church. So we offer up these sentiments of prayer to you, Father, in the name of your Son, Jesus, by the power of the Holy Spirit and with the loving hand of Mother Mary as we pray the perfect prayer that our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not but deliver us from evil. Amen. Saint Joseph, pray for us. Our Lady of Guadalupe, pray for us. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, so welcome to tonight's Reflection and Advent Catechesis, journeying with the church in the season of Advent. I'd like to start off tonight's reflection by way of introduction uh, to highlight the focus of this journey. As I was meditating and reflecting on what to teach tonight, initially I had thought that perhaps I would go through the gospel readings for the four Sundays of Advent, go through all of them and give you an exegesis of those gospel readings, but then I thought, well, I've already done that in the Liturgy of the Word prep that many of you have subscribed to, so I thought that I would pick and choose one specific topic that Holy Mother Church draws our attention to during the season of Advent, and that is the second advent of Christ, namely the second coming of Christ, and the end times, and the events leading up to and surrounding the second advent of Christ. Now, the, in theology, we call this eschatology. The study of the eschaton, coming from the Greek, which means the last things. Normally in eschatology, we talk about death, judgment, heaven, hell, purgatory, new heaven, new earth. For tonight, we're going to zero in on the second coming of Christ and the events leading up to it in the new heaven and the new earth. Now, the rationale behind choosing this particular topic during the season of Advent is twofold. First of all, as I mentioned, Holy Mother Church, as indicated in this past Sunday's Gospel, the first Sunday of Advent for Cycle C, Holy Mother Church calls our attention to focus on the second Advent of Christ. We begin the Advent season by looking forward to the future. We see it indicated in the prayers of the Mass for this past Sunday, as well as the Liturgy of the Word. When we're praying the Liturgy of the Hours in the Divine Office, the major theme that runs through all of the prayers is the second coming of Christ in glory. So since Holy Mother Church draws our attention to that specific mystery of our faith, I figured that it would be appropriate to meditate on that particular teaching of the Catholic Church. And then secondly, the rationale behind focusing on this particular topic is that it is the year of faith. 
And as Pope Benedict XVI pointed out in his apostolic letter, Porta Fidei, where he promulgated, in which he promulgated the year of faith, he mentions how the hope, his hope of the year of faith is that we as Catholics would reappropriate an exact knowledge and understanding of the contents of our Catholic faith as explicated and laid out in the catechism of the Catholic Church and, in speci and more specifically as laid out in the creed. And in the creed, there are three articles that are associated with, that are connected to, the second coming of Christ and the end times. As you see there on your handout, article 7 of the creed, from thence he, that is Jesus, will come to judge the living and the dead. Article 11, I believe in the resurrection of the dead. And Article 12, I believe in life everlasting. So three of the 12 articles of the creed have to do with eschatology, the end times. And so since this, the, since this is the year of faith, to reappropriate an exact knowledge and understanding of what we believe, we're going to take the lead of, we're going to follow the lead of Pope Benedict XVI and try to achieve an exact knowledge and understanding of what the church teaches about the end times, the second coming of Christ. Do we believe in the rapture as Catholics? The answer shall come in moments. And the answer shall come in, the, in a little bit, right? Moments to come. <laughs> okay, whatever. Outline of the talk. Two major components. I've divided this talk into two major components. First of all, we're going to give an exegesis of the gospel reading for this past Sunday, the first Sunday of Advent, uh, cycle C. And that is Jesus' teaching on his coming. The Son of Man will come upon the clouds, right? The coming of the Son of Man. What is Jesus referring to in that particular passage? And then the second major component of tonight's reflection will be the various stages of the end times, the events leading up to the second coming of Christ, and the events surrounding that will take place at the time of the second coming of Christ, as found in the Catechism and Scripture. Now, let me... Make uh, let me um, make a little disclaimer before we move forward. When we get to that particular component of tonight's reflection, there's going to be a lot of quotes from Scripture, from the Catechism. There's not much commentary that's necessary to give in these quotes because it's very clear. And when we get to that particular component of tonight's reflection, I'm going to share those quotes with you precisely because in order that you can know that it's not my theological opinion about these events of the end times, but it's actually the teaching of the church, which is basically an interpretation of what is revealed in sacred scripture. So we have this beautiful combination of sacred scripture and sacred tradition working together in, this, in tonight's presentation, okay? So let's dive right in with an exegesis of this past Sunday's gospel, which is the first Sunday of Advent for cycle C. And that is, Jesus is teaching on his coming according to St. Luke. Holy Mother Church in cycle C gives us St. Luke's version of Jesus' teaching about the Son of Man coming on the clouds. And we find it in Luke chapter 21, verses 25 through 28. Then there's a little section that Holy Mother Church left out for the particular gospel reading, but I'll refer to it in this talk. And then verses 34 through 36. So let, we're going to pick up with verse 25, and you have it here on the PowerPoint so you can follow along. Quote, Jesus says, There will be signs in the sun, the moon, the stars, and on earth nations will be in dismay, perplexed by the roaring of the sea and the waves. People will die of fright in anticipation of what is coming upon the world. For the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. But when these signs begin to happen, stand erect and raise your heads because your redemption is at hand. Verse 34. Beware that your hearts do not become drowsy 
from carousing and drunkenness and the anxieties of daily life. And that day catch you by surprise like a trap. For that day will assault everyone who lives on the face of the earth. Be vigilant at all times and pray that you have the strength to escape the tribulations that are imminent and to stand before the Son of Man. Close quote. Okay, what is Jesus talking about here? Well, the, f the first theme that we see is, bottom line, this is a prophecy of judgment. The details that are found in this teaching of Jesus, when read in light of the Old Testament and the Jewish tradition, reveals to us this indeed is a prophecy of judgment. So let's first establish this thesis, and then we'll make the application on who or what the judgment is on. So how do we know this is a prophecy of judgment? What are, what are our clues? Clue number one, the cosmic or cataclysmic imagery involving the sun, the moon, and the stars. We read in Luke 21 verse 25 here, Jesus said, there will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and on earth nations will be in dismay. Now, Matthew's version of this teaching of Jesus that he gave on the Mount of Olives, Matthew's version recounts it as follows. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. So St. Luke's version, he records Jesus simply saying there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. But Matthew's version, we get a little deeper explanation on what those signs are, the sun being darkened, the moon losing its light, the stars falling from heaven, right? Is this a prophecy of the end of the world? Well, not in light of the Jewish prophetical tradition. In the Jewish tradition, such cosmic and cataclysmic imagery was not used, in fact it was never used, to prophesy about the end of the world. It was used to prophesy about the end of a world, so to speak. The judgment or destruction of a wicked king, his empire, or even a wicked city who had become an enemy of God and his people. For example, in Isaiah chapter 13, verses 1 through 19, Isaiah uses this same cosmic cataclysmic imagery in regard to the destruction of Babylon. The wicked empire that led the southern Israelites into captivity and destroyed Jerusalem in the temple in 587 BC. When Isaiah prophesied how Babylon would come under God's judgment and how God would lead his people on a partial fulfillment of a new exodus, set them free from the Babylonian captivity and return them back to their homeland, Isaiah uses this imagery to describe how Babylon will be destroyed. Secondly, in Ezekiel chapter 32, Two, Ezekiel uses the same language or imagery in reference to the destruction of Egypt, a wicked city that was an enemy of God and his people. So the interpretive application for Jesus is that Jesus obviously, in light of the Jewish tradition, is pronouncing judgment on an enemy of God in the first century. Whether that enemy of God would be a king, a nation, a city, we're going to see in a few minutes. Clue number two that this is a prophecy of judgment. The imagery of the roaring of the sea and waves. In verse 25, Jesus said, Nations will be in dismay, perplexed by the roaring of the sea and the waves. What does that mean, Jesus? Well, once again, we got to go to the Old Testament. Jesus is a good Jewish boy. He's a good Jewish prophet. Remember, he's not only priest, he's not only king, he is prophet. And so often in his prophetical teachings, he uses imagery that comes from the prophetical tradition of Judaism and the history of Israel. So, what is the Old Testament backdrop for this image? Well, in Isaiah chapter 5, specifically verse 30, but within the whole context, Isaiah uses this imagery for the nation that God will rouse 
to punish wayward Israel. And that nation that God will allow to come and punish wayward Israel is Assyria. Israel in Isaiah chapter, excuse me, Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 5 is prophesying about how Assyria will come and destroy the northern kingdom of Israel. The northern Israelites led by Jeroboam, remember the schism and the division of the Davidic kingdom, led by Jerobo Jeroboam, set up their own kingdom, the kingdom of Israel, ten of the twelve tribes. Well, Isaiah says how God will lead this foreign nation to come and destroy wayward Israel because of their infidelity, their idolatry, etc. And that would take place in 722 BC. So let's see how Isaiah describes that destruction of the northern kingdom of Israel by Assyria. Verse 25 gives us the context. Therefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against his people. So there we have, the, it's, it establishes the context of judgment. Verse 26, he will raise a signal for a nation afar off. And we know that nation to be Assyria. And whistle for it from the ends of the earth. And lo, swiftly, speedily it comes. Here's the key verse, verse 30. They will growl over it on that day like the roaring of the sea. So in the prophetical tradition, the image of the roaring of the sea is used in reference to God coming in judgment on Israel by a foreign nation, by allowing a foreign nation to come and destroy Israel. So we come back to Jesus. And what does Jesus say? Within the context of this prophecy, he uses the same imagery, the roaring of the sea and the waves. So the interpretive application is that God is coming in judgment on a particular enemy of God. Like Assyria destroyed northern kingdom of Israel in 722 BC, something similar to that is about to happen in the first century. This is a prophecy of judgment. Clue number three, the imagery of the Son of Man coming on a cloud, right? Verse 27 we read, and then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. What does this mean? What does this signify? Well, once again, if we read it in light of the Jewish eyes or the Jewish mindset, we see that it is a prophecy of judgment. Two Old Testament backdrops for this. Number one, in the Old Testament, God coming on clouds is associated with judgment. Or you could state it, wherever the prophets talk about judgment, very often... God coming on clouds is associated with that prophecy of judgment. So for example, Jeremiah chapter 4 verses 11 through 13 is the context. Verse 11, we discover that it's a prophecy against Jerusalem because Jeremiah is foretelling the destruction of Jerusalem that took place in 587 BC by the Babylonian army led by King Nebuchadnezzar. But here we go in verse 12. Now it is I who speak in judgment upon them. So God is coming in judgment upon Jerusalem. Verse 13. Behold, he comes in the clouds. Or he comes up like clouds. His chariots like the whirlwind. His horses are swifter than eagles. Woe to us, for we are ruined. Close quote. We can also look at Isaiah chapter 19 verse 1. And Isaiah chapter 26 verse 21. Where God coming on a cloud is associated with with judgment. Second Old Testament backdrop for Jesus' teaching of the Son of Man coming on the clouds obviously, most importantly, comes from Daniel chapter 7. Verses 11 through 13 is the primary context where Daniel sees a vision of one like a Son of Man coming on the clouds to administer judgment on the fourth beast and approach the Ancient of Days and he receives an everlasting dominion and kingship and then the Son of Man hands over that kingship to the saints or to the holy ones. But in that prophecy, for the sake of this point, the Son of Man comes on the clouds is associated with judgment. Amen? So, the interpretive application, obviously Jesus is pronouncing judgment on a nation or a city or a wicked king that has become an enemy of God. This is what Jesus' is teaching is all about. A prophecy of judgment. Now, the question is, what or who is the judgment on? Many, many people, many Christians, many faithful Christians think that Jesus' prophecy here is primarily, only, merely 
about the end of the world. Because he talks about the Son of Man coming on the clouds. You have this sort of cosmic imagery of the sun and the moon and the stars and uh, a bunch of catastrophic stuff going on. So many will interpret this prophecy of Jesus as referring only to the end of the world. But there's a problem with that. A major problem. Precisely because Jesus, in both Luke's version of Luke 21 and Matthew's version of Matthew 24, Jesus says that these events will take place, will, um, that this generation would see these events, that these events would take place within a generation. And a generation in Jewish tradition is 40 years. But if Jesus was talking about merely the end of the world, well, guess what? Jesus got it wrong. And if he got it wrong, well, then he can't be God. He can't be divine, because if he was divine, he couldn't make a mistake, but here he made a mistake. And even Christians, to such a degree as C.S. Lewis, one of the most famous Christian apologists, is quoted for saying that in reference to this verse, that this is the most embarrassing verse in the Bible. C.S. Lewis himself thought that Jesus got it wrong. Another theologian, a Lutheran theologian, Albert Schweitzer, who is known for the quest for the historical Jesus, right? And he is known for saying that Jesus was a failed, quote, apocalyptic prophet, close quote. And then an atheist by the name of Bertrand Russell, Bertrand Russell, in his work, Why, am, Why I Am Not a Christian and the Divinity of Jesus, in his book, he states that Jesus made a mistake in this prophecy because 40 years later, guess what? The world was still a ticking. And so this is why he is not a Christian, because Jesus made... Why you want to follow some man who makes mistakes? I don't know about you and me. I don't know about you, but I don't want to follow some man who's subject to error and make mistakes, right? So, how do we respond to this claim that Jesus made a mistake? And on the surface, it seems as if Jesus did get it wrong about the end of the world. Well, my dear friends... As Holy Mother Church indicates by using this text in reference to the second coming, there are elements that can be applied to the end of time. But that is a secondary level of application of the text. There are polyvalent applications to this prophecy of Jesus. But first and foremost, the first level of interpretation for this prophecy is a literal historical level. And that is the prophecy is in reference to the judgment on Jerusalem that would take place in 70 AD when Jerusalem and the temple was destroyed, were destroyed by the Roman armies. Climaxing, finishing off the Roman Jewish war that would have began about 66 AD and then culminating in 70 AD when Jerusalem was burnt to the ground and then the temple was burnt as well. So what are our clues that would suggest that this prophecy is about the judgment on Jerusalem? What is our supporting evidence for this claim? Well, the first clue, there's, there are five clues that I'm going to share with you. Clue number one. Jesus' contextual prophecy of the destruction of the temple. If you just back up to the beginning of Luke chapter 21, right in verse 6, we discover this. Jesus says, quote, As for these things which you see, the days will come when there shall not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And what Jesus is referring to there is the temple. We also see it in Matthew's version. Before the Olivet Discourse, in Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 through 2, Jesus talks about how the temple will be destroyed. This is the context of Jesus' prophecy about the coming of the Son of Man within a generation. Clue number two. Jesus' contextual instructions on the signs preceding the event is localized in Jerusalem. The details that make up Jesus' teaching about the signs of this coming of the Son of Man 
or localized. They don't, they do not apply to something that's universal, like a universal judgment or the end of the whole world. It's, it's restricted to Jerusalem. So let's read this. Luke chapter 21, verses 20 through 22. Jesus says, But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. So note Jesus restricts the teaching to Jerusalem. It's localized. Verse 21. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Right? Folks, if this is about the end of the world... Will it make a difference if you flee to the mountains? No! If we're here in Wenatchee and the end of the world comes, I don't care how far into the mountains you go or how high up, you cannot escape the coming of the Son of Man at the end of time. But here, he's talking about how those Christians in Jerusalem, in Judea, when they see the signs, the army surrounding the city, flee to the mountains. Continuing the quote, and let those who are inside the city depart. And let not those who are out in the country enter it. For these are days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. Close quote. So Jesus' contextual instructions about the signs is, are, are localized in Jerusalem. Clue number three for a, this first level of interpretation, the literal historical context, destruction of Jerusalem. The cosmic or cataclysmic imagery of sun, moon, and stars in and of itself suggests the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. How so? Two ways. First of all, in the Old Testament, as we already mentioned, how is this imagery used in the uh, Jewish prophetical literature? It's used in reference to the destruction of a wicked city. Babylon, for example. Egypt is another example, right? Well, it makes perfect sense that if Jesus is referring to the destruction of Jerusalem that would take place 40 years later within a generation, well then it would, he, he would be right in the Jewish tradition of using such imagery in reference to the destruction of this wicked city that, has, that will, in, at that time, have already killed its Messiah <laughs> and actually persecuting the Messianic people. And then secondly, this is fascinating, the second way that we know that this imagery, this cosmic imagery, suggests the destruction of the temple is because the temple was a microcosmos in the Jewish tradition. It was a microcosm of the whole entire universe. And so the imagery of the universe, sun, moon, and stars, passing away, suggest the destruction of the microcosmos. So the imagery of this macrocosmos passing away suggests the destruction of the microcosmos, namely the temple. And here, are, here I'm going to give you five pieces, four pieces of supporting evidence that the temple, or the tabernacle of old, and then which was the prototype of Solomon's temple, was actually a mini cosmos, right? First supporting evidence. As you see there on the PowerPoint, stars and con the stars, stars and constellations of the stars were on the temple veil that separated the holy place and the holy of holies, and it was actually the color of the veil was kind of like this uh, sort of bluish purplish color that would symbolize the heavens, right, with the stars and the constellations. Secondly, the seven lights on the seven branched golden candles stick, the menorah, represented the light of the sun, the light of the moon. It even represented the seven known planets at the time of the first century. And so thus you have another element of the cosmos there in the tabernacle and in the temple. Third supporting evidence. Listen to what Psalm 78, 69 states. He built his sanctuary, that is in reference to the tabernacle of old and even also Solomon's temple. He built his sanctuary like the high heavens, like the earth, which he has founded forever. You see? So even Psalm 78 speaks of the sanctuary of God, the temple of God, being sort of a model, a mini model of the cosmos and the universe itself. And finally, the Jewish historian Josephus 
writes about this in his work, The Antiquities, or Antiquities, and he writes the following, quote, If anyone without prejudice and with judgment look upon these things, and he's referring to in the tabernacle, okay, Look upon these things, he will find they were in every one made in way of imitation and representation of the universe. When Moses distinguished the tabernacle into three parts, okay, he would be referring there to the Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant is, then right on the other side of the temple veil, the holy place, where you had the altar of incense, the golden altar of the bread and wine of presence, or the bread of the face of God, and then you had the menorah, that's in the holy place, and then outside of the holy place, you had the court the outer court where the priest would offer sacrifice on the altar and then you had the bronze laver of water where the priest would wash their hands in the water, okay? So that's what J Josephus is referring to. So distinguish the tabernacle into three parts, continue the quote, and allow two of them to the priest as a place accessible and common. He denoted the land and the sea, these being of general access to all. But he set apart the third division for God God because heaven is inaccessible to men. So Josephus is associating the Holy of Holies, which only the high priest could enter into one day out of the year, Yom Kippur. He associates that with heaven, the heavenly sanctuary, heaven itself. And in the holy place and the outer court, he associates with the land and the sea. Why? Because in the holy place, guess what was carved on the inner walls? palm trees suggesting the earth and you know what they refer to the outer court as the sea why because the bronze laver of water that the Jewish priests would wash their hands in they called that the sea that was a symbol of the sea so Josephus associates the structure of the tabernacle with the very universe itself and the cosmos. And we could go, we could spend literally an hour looking at further details that suggest how the tabernacle erected by Moses and the temple built by Solomon signifies the cosmos and the creation. Because it's an interesting study. When you look at the creation account in the book of Genesis, there are tons of details that connect to the building of the tabernacle in the wilderness and the building of the temple. And the idea is that that when you go to temple, when you go to the tabernacle, you're returning back to the Garden of Eden. It's a sort of foretaste of the restoration of creation, you see? Hint, hint for us as Catholics, that's what it's like for us to go to Mass, my dear friends. It is literally a foretaste of the return to the Garden of Paradise. And that's a whole nother talk in and of itself. Okay, so our third clue, that the sun, the moon, the stars suggest the destruction of the temple is because the temple, um, our third clue is that this imagery suggests the destruction of the temple. And the reason is because the temple is a mini cosmos. So the idea is that as the mini cosmos will be destroyed, right? As we're going to see in a minute, that points forward to the future of the passing away of the macro temple. So Jesus uses imagery of the macrocosmos passing away to signify the destruction of the mini cosmos. We move forward. Clue number four that Jesus' prophecy about the destruction of Jerusalem. Jesus says that the events would take place within a generation there in verse 32. Amen, I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things have taken place. And what's the historical context? Well, my dear friends, we know that Jesus began his ministry in 27 AD. And so that third year of his ministry would have been in 30 AD. And add 40 years later, what do you get? 70 AD. What happened in 70 AD? Jerusalem was destroyed by a foreign nation, namely Rome. And finally, the last clue, clue number five in this particular text that suggests it's a prophecy of judgment on Jerusalem in 70 AD is that Jesus teaches that the tribulation to come is imminent in verse 36. Be vigilant at all times and pray that you have the strength to escape the tribulations that are imminent. You see? 
So there's an urgency there in Jesus' prophecy. So was Jesus wrong? Was he a failed apocalyptic prophet? Was he a failure? Absolutely not. His prophecy indeed was fulfilled to the T. Jesus crossed his T's and dotted his I's. And it came to fulfillment in 70 AD. Now, you may ask, well, why does Holy Mother Church use this teaching of Jesus and the prophecy of the destruction of Jerusalem in reference to the end of the world at the end of time and the final second coming of Jesus Christ in glory? Because what happened to the temple and the surrounding events in 70 AD serves to be a type, my dear friends, of what is to come at the end of time. So this leads us to our second level of application of the prophecy of judgment. And that is, it is applied to the end of the world on a secondary level. So we first established the literal historical level, the literal sense, and then now we come to what the catechism calls the anagogical sense. Anagoge, coming from the Greek, which means to lead unto, pointing to the future, you see? So the first clue that this prophecy of judgment refers to the end of the world is because, as I mentioned, uh, the Holy Mother Church uses this text in reference to the second coming of Christ. The whole Mass or the first Sunday of Advent is oriented toward the second advent of Christ and this is the Gospel reading. So the Church sees in this text a foreshadowing and a pointing to the end of time, the end of the world, the second coming of Christ. And then secondly, as I mentioned, the destruction of, Jeru the, destruction of the temple itself is a clue of the end of time. Why? Because it was a mini cosmos. So just as the mini cosmos will be destroyed, that's a sign and a type of the passing away of the macro cosmos. You see, friends, when God writes his divine drama of salvation history, unlike us who write with ink and pens, God writes with people places and events. So events in history, in God's plan, in his story of salvation, serve to be types and signs of what is to come in the future. So because the temple is destroyed, we can see an application to the end of time, precisely because it was a mini cosmos. So just as you had a nation who put itself in opposition to God's plan and became an enemy of God, you have a particular city here, becoming an enemy of God. In the book of Revelation, we refer to Jerusalem as Sodom and a new Egypt. And we also see in the book of Revelation, Jerusalem is a new Jericho and a new Babylon. All enemies of God's people. And so just as Jerusalem set itself against God's plan and became an enemy of God, killing its Messiah and persecuting the Messianic people because the first persecution of the Christians in the first century came from the Jews. Acts chapter 7, remember? St. Stephen? He is mortar. He's the first Christian martyr. And he's mortar, he's murdered and killed by the Jewish elders, the Jewish religious leaders. Acts chapter 12, I believe it is. James the Greater has his head cut off, right? And so we have this first century persecution from the Jews. In the book of Revelation, I think it's Revelation chapter 2 in the seven letters that Jesus addresses to those seven local churches of Asia Minor. Jesus calls the Jewish synagogue a synagogue of Satan. Suggesting that the first century persecution came from the Jewish religious leaders. You see? And so it, Jerusalem set itself as an enemy of God and God came in judgment on that enemy to vindicate his people, the holy ones, the Christians to avenge the blood of the mortars. In Revelation 6, 9 through 10, remember and the fifth seal opens up? The fifth seal of the scroll is open. What does John see? He sees those who were slain for the testimony of Jesus, crying out, How long, O God, will thou avenge our blood on the people on earth? You see? Now, my friends, that serves to be a type of what will come in the future when there will be many nations gathered together by the Antichrist, as we're going to see in a few moments, setting themselves up against God, making themselves enemies of God. And God, indeed, Jesus Christ, will come in judgment on that Antichrist, on those nations. 
and the macrocosmos, just like the mini cosmos was destroyed and passed away to make way for the new temple in heaven, which we see revealed in the book of Revelation. So too at the end of time, the macrocosmos, my dear friends, will pass away. What are the details of that passing away? We don't quite know. But it indeed will pass away. Why? To make way for a new heaven and a new earth where the heavenly temple will dwell on earth and heaven and earth will become one. You see? So this is why Jesus' prophecy about the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in 70 AD points forward to, serves to be a type of the second coming of Christ and the end of time. Does that make sense? Okay. Third, and finally, the third level of application. That is the moral level. And the moral level, I think, can be applied to the advent of Christ, the coming of Christ, at our particular judgment. When Christ comes for us individually, you see, we see a reference and an implication for the general judgment in the future. But there's also our particular judgment for the individual soul when Christ comes to take us home. And we have a clue of this in verse 36 of Luke chapter 21 where Jesus talks about standing before the Son of Man. Now, that does indeed refer to the general judgment at the end of time, but St. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive good or evil according to what he has done in the body. And in Hebrews 9, 27, the author of Hebrews says, It is appointed for every man to die once, then the judgment. St. Paul says here, that's the judgment seat of Christ. We stand before Christ. And so in this prophecy of Jesus, on a moral level, in a moral sense, we can apply this to our own lives and make sure that we are ready for the advent of Christ in our particular judgment. Well, how does the destruction of the temple apply to Christ's coming for my soul? Well, my dear friends, this is a call to conversion. Amen? Because it is a call to conversion lest my soul become an enemy of God. Just as Jerusalem itself had become an enemy of God, it was destroyed. And guess what? You know why the temple was destroyed? Because the temple had become an idol, friends. Because the Jews in the first century had replaced the true temple. They chose the... They chose the... Excuse me. They replaced the true temple with the old temple. They destroyed the true temple, Jesus' body, in place, in, in, for the sake of the physical temple. And so God is going to come and destroy that idol, putting the temple before Jesus. Well, my friends, that's a sign for us in our own individual soul. Let us pray that we do not make ourselves an idol. Amen? Let us pray that we do not put our own judgment and our own will before the intellect and will of Almighty God. Lest we be destroyed, spiritually speaking. It's called mortal sin, right? And so this is a call to conversion that we stay pure and remain faithful to Jesus Christ the Messiah. And look and wait in joyful hope for the second advent of Christ. Lest we be destroyed like Jerusalem and the temple. So there's a moral sense here as well. Okay, so that concludes our exegesis of this past Sunday's Gospel reading for the first Sunday of Advent, Cycle C. Jesus is teaching on the coming of the Son of Man. So hopefully you can see there uh, how Christians have always looked at this text. And this is how the early church fathers read this prophecy of Jesus as well. They understood it primarily to be referring to Jerusalem, which was a type of the second coming, and then also a moral sense. Now, we move to our second major component of tonight's reflection. And we'll go through maybe the first stage or the second stage and then we'll take our break, okay? So we come to the stages of the last days. There are seven stages that we can sort of categorize the events in according to the catechism and scripture. And as I mentioned before, it's going to be a lot of quotes from both the catechism and the scripture. So hang in there. I have it on the PowerPoint for you so you can just follow along, sit back and relax. But hopefully you'll see how all of these 
text from the catechism and the scripture are put together in a systematic ordering in these seven stages that hopefully you can assimilate into your own thought process and be able to access uh, the events leading up to the second coming of Christ in light of the structure that I've presented to you tonight, okay? So let's start with stage one. Stage one of the last days, the ascension and the birth of the church on the day of Pentecost. Here's what the Catechism states. In paragraph 670, we discover that the renewal of creation is underway already. The new creation is already underway, but yet not complete. And it's been underway since the ascension. The Catechism states, quote, Since the ascension, God's plan has entered into its fulfillment. We are already at the last hour. Already the final age of the world is with us. And the renewal of the world is irrevocably underway. It is even now anticipated in a certain real way. For the church on earth is endowed already with a sanctity that is real but imperfect. Close quote. So we're already in the end times, my friends. We're already in the last hour. We're already in the final age. And it was ushered in and began with the ascension of Christ. So we're in the end times. So the renewal of creation is already underway, but not yet complete. Now, in paragraph 671 to 672, we discover that the messianic kingdom, the kingdom of the, of the Messiah, is present in mystery, but not yet perfected in glory until the second coming. So the messianic kingdom is already here, namely the church. Listen to what the, what the catechism states in paragraph 671. Quote, Though already present in his church, Christ's reign is nevertheless yet to be fulfilled. So note, it's, Christ's reign is already present in and through the church. But there's still an element where it's not fully fulfilled yet. Uh, so it's not yet to be fulfilled with, excuse me, Christ's reign is nevertheless yet to be fulfilled with power and great glory by the king's return to earth. You ever wondered where J.R. Tolkien got the third part of the trilogy, the return of the king? This is where he got it from. The revelation of Christianity about the return of King Jesus, okay? Continuing the quote, that is why Christians pray above all in the Eucharist to hasten Christ's return by saying to him, Maranatha, our Lord come, close quote. So Christ already reigned in the church, but yet that reign is not yet perfected until when he comes in power and great glory, when he returns for the second time. Paragraph 672 continues with the following, with the same theme. Before his ascension, Christ affirmed that the hour had not yet come for the glorious establishment of the messianic kingdom awaited by Israel, which according to the prophets was to bring all men the definitive order of justice, love, and peace. So note how the catechism affirms that the definitive order of absolute perfection of the kingdom has not yet come. Continue the quote, according to the Lord, the present time is the time of the spirit and of witness. But, and that would be mortaroi, the time of martyrdom, right? Witnessing to Jesus Christ. But also a time still marked by distress and a trial of evil, which does not spare the church and ushers in the struggles of the last days. It is a time of waiting and watching. So from these two paragraphs of the Catechism, we see that the Messianic Kingdom is present on this earth. It is here, but yet in mystery. And consequently, the last days have begun. The end times have begun because the Messianic Kingdom that the prophets foretold is present in the church. But there is, it is still a time of waiting where the Spirit leads and guides us to be mortars for Jesus Christ, waiting in joyful hope for that day when the kingdom on earth will enter into its state of glory with the second coming of Christ. So this is the first stage. We're in the end times, okay? So whenever you watching TV and you're watching those televangelists talking about the end times, get ready for the end times, glory to God, hallelujah. 
Get yourselves ready, brothers and sisters, right? All you got to say is, hey, we're already in the end times. No need to worry, right? We're in the last days, persevering on this journey of faith in the wilderness, journeying to the promised land of heaven. All right, stage two, the conversion of the Jews. We're going to start with the scriptural testimony and then we'll look at the Catechism of the Catholic Church which, which is an interpretation of the scriptural testimony. What we find both in scripture and the teaching of the church is that a conversion of the Jews is an essential element that makes up the events leading to the second coming of Christ. So let's start with the scriptural revelation. St. Paul writes in Romans chapter 11 verse 12 and then we're going to look at 23 through 31. Verse 12. Now if their, trespass, if their trespass means riches for the world and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? Now, St. Paul is referring to the Jewish people. They failed, and because of their failure, the gospel went out to the Gentiles in the Father's divine plan. So St. Paul is saying, if their failure meant the inclusion of the Gentiles, what's their inclusion going to mean? Meaning the Jews, when the Jews accept the gospel, what is it going to mean? So there's an implication that the Jews will accept the Messiah and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 23, and even the others, if they do not persist in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. Who again? The Jews, right? Verse 24, for if you have been cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these natural branches be grafted back into their own olive tree? So we as the Gentiles, we've been grafted onto the olive tree while the Jews were cut off. But St. Paul seems to imply that they're going to be grafted back on. Verse 25, lest you be wise in your own conceits. I want you to understand this mystery, brethren. A hardening has come upon part of Israel until the full number of the Gentiles come in and so all Israel will be saved. As, as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. Verse 27, and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but now have received mercy because of their disobedience so they have now been disobedient in order that by the mercy shown to you they also may receive mercy close quote so that's St. Paul's teaching on the conversion of the Jews being an essential element of the Father's plan of salvation. Now let's look at the Catechism, which is actually an interpretation of that text. The Catechism affirms what St. Paul is saying here. Paragraph 674, the glorious Messiah's coming is suspended at every moment of history until his recognition by all Israel. And the Catechism goes on to quote the text we just referred to, Romans 11, 20 through 26. Continuing the Catechism, paragraph 674, the full inclusion of the Jews and the Messiah's salvation in the wake of the full number of the Gentiles will enable the people of God to achieve the measure of the stature of of the fullness of Christ in which God may be all in all, close quote. So the catechism in its section on the end times, okay, in its section on eschatology mentions the conversion of the Jews as being an essential element. Now, does this mean every single ethnic Jewish person will be saved? Well, the answer is not quite. Listen to what one dogmatic treatise has to say about this text and about this teaching of the church. Quote, There is no reason to assume that the Jews will all be converted or that the Hebrew race will embrace the true faith in a body. So what, what it's stating is not every single ethnic Jew will embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ. He goes on, Like the Gentiles... The Jews will probably flock to the church in great numbers. So at least we can say that, that there will be a special outpouring of actual graces on the Jewish people. 
that will move their intellect, enlighten their intellect with the light of the gospel and move their will to choose and accept the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that mass conversion of the Jews will be a sign of the glorious second coming of Jesus Christ. This is an essential stage that constitutes the last days leading up to the end times and the second coming of Christ. Isn't that interesting? I tell you what, the first time I, I found that, I, I discovered this in the teaching of the church, I, I was fascinated with that. So, the point is, is that, you know, this people that God used to prepare the world for the coming of his son, Jesus Christ, he didn't just throw them off to the wayside, folks. We see that, obviously, in salvation history, the Jewish people were established to orient and lead God's, uh, the humanity to the church because Judaism would be the seed of the flowering of Christianity. But still, that ethnic people that God used in history to prepare us for the Messiah, he, as a father, will indeed pour forth a spirit special grace of love and mercy on them, as St. Paul talks about, and lead them into the covenantal family of God. You see? So it's an amazing thing to think about, the Father's providential care of still, within salvation history, the Jewish people. So they still have a part to play in the divine drama of salvation. So that concludes stage two. So stage one, the ascension and the birth of Christ, the beginning of the end time. Stage two, the conversion of the Jews. Let's go ahead and take a break right now, and when we come back, we'll pick up with stage three, the great apostasy, the tribulation, and the Antichrist.